The Psychology of Emotion One is apt to think of the emotions as independent from habit. We easily may think of one acquiring habits of action or even of thinking, but we are apt to regard the emotions as something connected with feeling and quite divorced from intellectual effort. Yet, notwithstanding the distinction between the two, both are dependent largely upon habit, and one may repress, increase, develop, and change one's emotions, just as one may regulate habits of action and lines of thought. It is an axiom of psychology that emotions deepen by repetition. If a person allows a state of feeling to thoroughly take possession of him, he will find it easier to yield to the same emotion the second time, and so on until the particular emotion or feeling becomes second nature to him. If an undesirable emotion shows itself inclined to take up a permanent abode with you, you had better start to work to get rid of it, or at least to master it. And the best time to do this is at the start, for each repetition renders the habit more firmly entrenched and the task of dislodging it more difficult. Were you ever jealous? If so, you will remember how insidious was its first approach how subtly it whispered hateful suggestions into your willing ear, and how gradually it followed up such suggestions until, finally, you began to see green. Jealousy has an effect upon the bile and causes it to poison the blood. This is why the idea of green is always associated with it. Then you will remember how the thing seemed to grow, taking possession of you until you scarcely could shake it off. You found it much easier to become jealous the next time. It seemed to bring before you all sorts of objects apparently justifying your suspicions and feeling. Everything began to look green. The green-eyed monster waxed fat. And so it is with every feeling or emotion. If you give way to a fit of rage, you will find it easier to become angry the next time, on less provocation. The habit of feeling and acting mean does not take long to firmly settle itself in its new home if encouraged. Worry is a great habit for growing and waxing fat. People start by worrying about big things, and then begin to worry and fret about some smaller thing. And then the merest trifle worries and distresses them. They imagine that all sorts of evil things are about to befall them. If they start on a journey, they are certain there is going to be a wreck. If a telegram comes, it is sure to contain some dreadful tidings. If a child seems a little quiet, the worrying mother is positive it is going to fall ill and die. If the husband seems thoughtful as he resolves some business plan in his mind, then the good wife is convinced that he is beginning to cease to love her and indulges in a crying spell. And so it goes. Worry, worry, worry. Each indulgence making the habit more at home. After a while, the continued thought shows itself in action. Not only is the mind poisoned by the blue thoughts, but the forehead shows deep lines between the eyebrows, and the voice takes on that whining, rasping tone so common among worry-burdened people. The condition of mind known as fault-finding is another emotion that grows fat with exercise. First, fault is found with this thing, then with that, and finally with everything. The person becomes a chronic nagger, a burden to friends and relatives, and a thing to be avoided by outsiders. Women make the greatest naggers, not because men are any better, but simply because a man nagger is apt to have the habit knocked out of him by other men who will not stand his nonsense. He finds that he is making things too hot for himself, and he reforms, while a woman has more of a chance to indulge in the habit. But this nagging is all a matter of habit. It grows from small beginnings, and each time it is indulged in, it throws out another root branch or tendril, and fastens itself the closer to the one who has given it soil in which to grow. Envy, uncharitableness, gossip, scandal-mongering, all are habits of this kind. The seeds are in every human breast, and only need good soil and a little watering to become lusty and strong. Each time you give way to one of these negative emotions, the easier do you make it for a recurrence of the same thing, or similar ones. Sometimes, by encouraging one unworthy emotion, you find that you have given room for the growth of a whole family of these mental weeds. Now, this is not a good old orthodox preachment against the sin of bad thoughts. It is merely a calling of your attention to the law underlying the psychology of emotion. Nothing new about it. Old as the hills. So old that many of us have forgotten all about it. If you wish to manifest these constantly disagreeable and unpleasant traits, 
and to suffer the unhappiness that comes from them, by all means do so. That is your business and privilege. It's none of mine, and I am not preaching at you. It keeps me busy minding my own business and keeping an eye on my own undesirable habits and actions. I am merely telling you the law regarding the matter, and you may do the rest. If you wish to choke out these habits, there are two ways open to you. First, whenever you find yourself indulging in a negative thought or feeling, take hold of it and say to it firmly and vigorously, Get out! It won't like this at first and will bridle up, curve its back, and snarl like an offended cat. But never mind, just say scat to it. The next time it will not be so confident and aggressive. It will have manifested a little of the fear habit. Each time you repress and choke out a tendency of this kind, the weaker it will become, and the stronger will your will be. Professor James says, Refuse to express a passion and it dies. Count ten before venting your anger, and its occasion seems ridiculous. Whistling to keep up courage is no mere figure of speech. On the other hand, sit all day in a moping posture, sigh, and reply to everything with a dismal voice, and your melancholy lingers. There is no more valuable precept in moral education than this, as all who have experience know. If we wish to conquer emotional tendencies in ourselves, we must assiduously and in the first instance cold-bloodedly go through the outward movements of those contrary dispositions we prefer to cultivate. Smooth the brow, brighten the eye, contract the dorsal rather than the ventral aspect of the frame, and speak in a major key. Pass the genial compliment, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not gradually thaw.